Hello, everybody. Welcome to September's live Q&A with Dr. Green and Dr. Kat. I'm Angela. I'm going to be fielding all of your questions and uh, letting our doctors take their pick of your exceptional uh, concerns for the night and addressing them as we can, uh, as best we can. And I am going to let our doctors introduce themselves. Dr. Kat, say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kat Brown. I'm the medical director at Winona. Um, I'm based out of the Philadelphia area. I'm in the Philadelphia suburbs um, and am a board certified OBGYN who's been caring for women my entire career and now um, happy to be helping menopausal women and perimenopausal women in midlife live their best life. So um, if you can, if you have questions, start putting them in the chat so that we can have something to talk about. Um, and before Dr. Green gives his intro too, um, I just want to let you know if any of you are in the New York area, we're going to be having a Winona meetup next week, actually, next Tuesday morning um, in New York City for any of you that are in that area. Um, and so we can, um, if you go to the Winona, I think it's on our Instagram page, Angela, mm -hmm. yep. has the details. I'll put a yeah. link so, for you guys. Yeah, we like to do local meetups. We like to meet our patients in person, um, but I think it's also good for you to see us here live on the webinar to know that we are indeed real people. Every once in a while, I get a patient who thinks I'm a bot and doesn't think I'm real, but we are real and we, we'd love to meet with you and answer your questions and help you feel more comfortable and help you learn more about this time in your life as well. So Dr. Green, take it away. Uh, so um, hi, my name is Mike Green. Uh, I am also a board certified OGYN. I'm the chief medical officer of Winona, and I love answering your questions. So I don't see any questions in there yet. So type faster. Um, but uh, yeah, we want to we want to answer your questions. And actually, yeah, we, uh, talk about local meetups. We had a really fun one uh, last uh, so last Saturday. Mm -hmm. It was, was so fun. fun. It was really great. Like yeah, we uh, we did a spin class. Uh, and which was my first and if if you like want to do something that's really fun and then you don't you can't walk for two days i highly recommend it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we had yeah. what like 80 women and uh we did a live we did a real live live q a in the flesh uh afterwards it was a blast um, yeah. so yeah if you can get to the new york one they're a lot of fun and you can see us in person and uh yeah we really so was that your first uh, your first spin class ever? It was my first spin class ever. I'm in the gym three to four days a week, but for me, you know, it's like picking up heavy things and putting them back down. So, you know, we have a saying more than five reps is cardio, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, our, uh, our our post office is on the other side of the um, of the uh, parking lot. So my wife and I, we we uh, we lift together. And then when we're done, we're like, well, let's do cardio. And then we walk across the parking lot to get our mail. So yes. <laughs> that's my cardio. Nice. I love, that. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, one of the things, well, so Dr. Green met my childhood friend, Kayla, who owns the franchise that we were doing the spinning at. It's called Star Cycle, which is like Soul Cycle or whatever spinning franchise is popular. If you're in the Santa Barbara area, I highly recommend it. She's amazing. Yeah. She was so she I mean, she's a pro. She's been doing this forever. But, um, you know, her big thing, aside from working out, is talking to perimenopausal women about why they need to eat protein. And it's so funny because I follow her on Instagram and there, there was like a week or two or three where big every day she was like, ladies, eat protein. If you're in this stage of life, you need to eat protein, you need to eat protein, you need to eat protein. And um, so when I saw her, I was like, so I have a question for you. She's like, what's that? I was like, so how much protein? Just giving her a hard time. But I thought maybe while we're waiting, we could talk about either of you. Why for the, for the people at home, for the, the seven people in this meeting who aren't asking any questions that maybe we could <laughs> inform them or give them a little bit yeah. to go as to why, why should you, uh, why do you need to up your protein? It, it's really important. Actually, I, I have this advice for patients all the time when they message me, um, you know, wondering when the, the weight loss is going to start, like when they start their HRT. 
And that's one of my first questions is how much protein are you getting in? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Green and I both recommend to patients that they do like a nutrition audit, like they do a log of like what they're taking in. And I think a lot of women don't understand how much protein they need. And I think when we're younger, um, our body can extract the protein a little bit easier from things that we eat. And then in midlife, I think we have to be a little bit more conscientious about our intake because if you're not getting enough protein to maintain the muscle mass that you have, you're not going to lose any fat because your body is in this mode of retaining every bit of calorie and it's not going to burn the fat for calories if you're not getting giving it enough protein to burn for calories for your energy expenditure. So often, you know, we think we're getting enough protein if we have like, you know, protein with each meal. But like me personally, I'm 5'8", I'm um, is my height. And for my height, when I looked at the, all the calculators out there, like there's different body types, like you can be an endomorph or an ectomorph or a mesomorph based on your muscle makeup. But based on my body type and my height, I found out I need 120 grams of protein to really get enough protein. And when I was doing my nutrition audit, thinking that I was doing good, I was routinely between 60 and 80 on a daily basis. I wasn't getting enough. So there's other ways that you can supplement and that you can get extra protein. For me, I do Fair Life Nutrition Shakes or Protein Shakes. Um, and I get them at Costco because I like to get everything at Costco. <laughs> um, but anyway, they have they have different protein shakes, and if you're they're okay for you if you're okay with dairy. If if you're not okay with dairy, you have to go through um, do other forms of protein, maybe like whey protein, do your own shakes at home, things like that. But the Fairlife shakes they have anywhere from 30 grams of protein in one bottle, and to me it tastes like chocolate milk. So it's really easy for me to have one of those with breakfast, you know, have one of those, have a coffee and maybe something, you know, fruit and eggs or something in the morning. Um, because if you don't get enough protein, your body is just going to keep retaining all that extra fat that you're trying to lose. And especially that meno belly, you know, that we tend to accumulate weight in our midsection as we age as women, um, because of our rising cortisol levels. So if we don't get enough protein in our diet, our body is going to keep using protein and, and um, retaining the fat. Like, and so we're not going to be able to maintain the good muscle health and the good muscle um, mass that we want, that we want to keep. And a lot of women are worried about lifting and worried about taking too much protein, thinking they're going to bulk up and they're going to get like, you know, too big. But if you look at what bodybuilders have to do in order to get the mass that they want to accumulate, they have to take in a tremendous amount of protein. You could probably speak more to that, Dr. Green, because you have a little bit more experience with bodybuilding community than I do. Um, but yeah, they take always, in a lot of protein. That always cracks me up. It's like, you're not going to like wake up one day and all of a sudden look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It just doesn't happen. I wish it did. <laughs> but it, right. it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like, you know, uh, gee, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to, uh, to get up on a on a uh on a piece of equipment because all of a sudden i'm going to look like an olympic gymnast it's like no it doesn't work that way so um uh i can tell you you know we lift my wife and i lift three to four days a week um and she does the same we do the same exercise routine together it's one of the things we love to do and she's very conscientious about her protein intake and she does not look bulky or huge but she looks no, good not at because, all <laughs> um, because yeah because muscle mass first of all for your health, muscle mass is really important um, uh, to maintain that muscle mass. Um, it can help, uh, you know, with your bone health. It can help with, you know, your stamina, fatigue, all, all kinds of important things. Um, but it also makes you look better. Um, and so, you know, let's face it, we all want to be healthier and look better. Um, and so maintaining your muscle mass is, is really key. And you're not going to turn into a bodybuilder or, you know, some, you know, the Hulk um, by, uh, by increasing your protein, but it is going to help you stay healthy because you really don't want to sacrifice your muscle mass. That's not the way you want to lose weight. Um, and so um, it's yeah. really, it's really, a, a, I think it's, people are now starting to realize it a lot more. Um, you know, we've kind of been lied to nutrition wise for many reasons, um, but a lot political. Um, you know, you look at the four basic food groups, uh, well, that was done by the dairy industry, which is why they got their own food group. And basically, uh, because they spent a lot of money talking to Congress. Lobbying to make the FDA, right. Lobbying and making FDA, that food right. pyramid that we all had to study in school. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah a lot, all the nutrition stuff we learned in school is mostly wrong, um, which is really sad. 
Um, and so you kind of have to relearn it. But protein really is key. Um, and then, you know, people talk about these macros, proteins, fats, and cholesterols. Um, I'm sorry, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Uh, really, if you get your protein in and the rest of your calories can just be sort of split between fats and carbohydrates, you're going to be fine. But it's protein that you really need to concentrate on. Looks like we may have some questions. Yeah, it looks like we finally got somebody who was willing to, to play with us today. All right, Melanie says, uh, would we please talk about how long women can safely take HRT and do you need to stop at age 60? So it's important to start before the age of 60, um, but you don't have to stop. It's not a hard stop once you hit that age. So for most women, um, it, you take HRT as long as you need to, to adequately treat your symptoms that you're suffering from, the symptoms that are bothersome to your life. And when we were in training many years ago, they used to tell us the lowest dose for the shortest duration possible. Um, but really now we're seeing that there's so many benefits and so many good things that come from hormone replacement therapy and from estrogen replacement that if you're on a low dose and you're doing well with it, there's really no hard cutoff of when you need to stop. It can actually be very protective for your heart, protective for your brain. Um, so if you talk to female OBGYNs that are there themselves taking HRT, many of them don't ever want to stop. Um, because they see the benefits and they really see the, the positives from the medication. So it's one of those things that when, when it comes time and you're starting to feel like you want to go off of HRT, have a conversation with your doctor, talk about the risks and benefits, and you can always trial going off the medication and see how you feel, see if your symptoms come back or if you do well without them. But the average woman tends to be on HRT like three to five years sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little less. Every woman is unique. So that's something that, you know, we like to cater the treatment to you as an individual. Awesome. Okay. We have another question. Melanie is also asking if we can talk about the side effects of HRT that she's heard old studies that have been debunked, but she doesn't know about that. So sounds like there's still some concerns about the debunking. <laughs> so take it away, either of you. So there's two different that dark things. Green? Yeah. Yeah, there's two different things sort of that's loaded in that question. Um, side effects and risks, which really are, are different things. So risks are, are sort of bad things that can happen to you um, from doing something. Side effects are really sort of usually more annoying things um, that are part of the treatment. So um, side effects from HRT for most people are fairly unusual and usually pretty mild when they happen. So um, breast tenderness is probably the most common thing if we sort of overshoot the dose. Um, and some women get that right away at the beginning and then it kind of goes away with time. But if it's not going away, then sometimes we have to back off the dose. Um, that's probably the most common side effect, I think, especially from sort of overshooting mm -hmm. the dose. Um, the DHEA can sometimes cause acne. It's usually temporary and goes away, but for some women, they're just really sensitive to it, or sometimes we need to back off the dose as well. So those are probably the two most common things we see. Um, the oral preparations, so the estrogen and progesterone pills can sometimes cause some nausea. Um, it can theoretically happen with the patches and the creams, but I think we see it a lot less because you don't have to put it through your, your stomach and your GI tract. So um, we tend to get a lot less of that. So those are sort of side effects. Risks are really kind of a different thing. And I think that's what you're referring to in the second half of your question. So there was a study called the Women's Health Initiative Study. And it's kind of funny, actually, I was, I was going to bring it up. And then I, I did it when you said it when we were in training, because actually when I was in training, we were told to give hormones to everybody, no matter how old they were, and just keep giving them, giving them, giving them. And then the Women's <laughs> Health Initiative Study came out and that sort of changed. And this uses little for as uh, the smallest dose for the shortest period of time possible. And now I think the pendulum is swinging back to a more reasonable place. Um, but the study came out and really, you know, we bag on this study quite a bit, but if you actually really look at what the study said, it wasn't really that bad of a study. The problem was the, before the study actually came out, there was all this sort of press releases that got picked up by the papers and there were these big headlines that, you know, your doctor's trying to kill you with HRT and everybody went into a panic. Um, and one of the things that the headline said is, oh, it's going to give you breast cancer and all these other things. And actually, that's not really what the study said. What the study said is that, hey, stop giving this to everybody like it's a vitamin. You've got to do a risk assessment and make sure that this is safe. But if you properly assess your patient and you give it to 
properly screen patients, it's actually very safe. Um, and so um, if you've had a hysterectomy, actually estrogen only HRT decreases, well, at least it doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer. And there's some data that it may actually decrease it a bit. So estrogen yeah. actually, you know, doesn't cause a new breast cancer to occur. It can make an existing breast cancer grow more quickly, but it, it doesn't cause breast cancer. Estrogen and progesterone together does slightly increase the risk of breast cancer. And so that's sort of the, the, the risk that people are always afraid of. But if you look at everything in a balance, um, it decreases your risk of cardiovascular disease and you're much more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than you are to die of breast cancer. And so because of that and other benefits, you actually have on HRT, if you're properly screened, um, you have a better chance of living longer and living healthier, which is really what it's all about. Um, and so it decreases the risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, um, dementia, and Alzheimer's, uh, certain cancers like colon cancer. Um, and so in the whole, it actually decreases your risk of bad things happening to you rather than increase your risk. So that's kind of a, a kind of differentiation between risks and, and side effects, which really are sometimes we kind of talk about those together, but they're actually two kind of separate things. So HRT for the appropriately screened patient is ex extremely safe. Um, and the risks are, are really very small. And the other thing, like, I was kind of surprised that my wife, when I brought this up to my wife was surprised about this, but it actually is much safer than birth control pills. Um, so people just like think about take birth controls without thinking about it, but actually they have a lot more risk, uh, than HRT. Um, it's just that, you know, people are younger and so it's less likely for something to happen to you when you're younger, but the actual risks are, are higher. So risks of things like blood clots and, and these kind of scary problems. So HRT is actually very safe um, and um, in the whole, good for your health. Uh, Dr. Green, I have a question about the birth control situation. Mm -hmm. So like, it's obviously really common, I think in my experience even, before I came to Winona to have like your in-person gyno say, oh, you're having perimenopause symptoms. Like, we'll just put you on birth control when like, I didn't need to be on birth control at, for any other reason. And it was like, here, we'll just give you this. Right. So like, why is that the easier suggestion? It's just people are used to prescribing it or what's the situation there? Yes. It, it's because it's what they know in their tool bag. It's what they've been prescribing their entire career. And so it's like a crutch. It's it's something that they go to instantly that they had the experience with, especially you know, we were talking about like, um, you know, the younger generation of, of OBGYNs don't have a lot of experience with menopause and don't have a lot of extra training because of that pendulum swinging so far the other direction as a result of the WHI study. So, you know, as a result, you have an entire generation of physicians that aren't comfortable with HRT and they're now like, as they're getting older, they're relearning it for themselves. You know, we may have studied, they may have studied a little bit, but they're, they just don't have the experience level with it like they do with birth control. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's yeah really if you look at the, the, the day in the life of an OBGYN, you spend most of your time taking care of pregnant women and women that don't, that are trying to avoid pregnancy. That's what you do. That's your bread and butter. Um, and then you spend a good amount of time doing surgery and, um, you know, working people up for surgery, hysterectomies and you know, different surgeries that we do. Saving spend, women from bad periods, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then you spend a very little bit of your time doing hormone management and, and helping women through the menopause transition. So it's, it's actually a very small part of a normal OBGYN's practice. And most, most don't get very good at it for that reason. Whereas at Winona, this is kind of what we do all day long. And so we become experts and are very comfortable with it and understand the nuances um, and the differences between um, birth control pills, for instance, and the kinds of hormones and the doses of hormones in birth control pills and HRT, which sort of brings us to the next question, right? Yeah. So let's talk about what uh, the question is. Uh, can you talk about what bioidentical HRT actually is? Yeah. So, I mean, the main thing is that the word bioidentical is simply an adjective. Um, and what it means is that if, if something is bioidentical, it means it's identical to what your body would make naturally on its own. 
So the main difference when you look at HRT that's available, you know, from a traditional prescription or even birth control, those are synthetic hormones. Those aren't the same biologic structure of hormones that your body would create on its own inside the ovaries. So when we say bioidentical, what we're meaning is that we're giving you estrogens that are similar, that are identical really to the estrogens your body creates on its own. Um, so that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite. Sorry, it's a little distracting watching things going by in the background. The big pharmaceutical companies have made this term biosimilar um, for their synthetic hormones. It's a marketing term, so they're not bioidentical. They're biosim, you know, they're they're similar. Um, but I think I'd rather have identical than similar. And honestly, you know, we really see a difference. Um, you know, I, I see that in my patients with bioidentical hormones. They're they. Um, they work better. They seem to have less side effects um, and um, and safer. The other class of hormone is something called Premarin, uh, which stands for pregnant mare urine. Um, they also call it conjugated equine estrogen. Equine again is a term for horse, and it's literally estrogens that are taken out of the urine of horses. And horses have like I don't know 17, 18, a ton of different estrogens. Very few of those are actually found in humans. Um, and so you get all these horse estrogens as well as some of the estrogens are, are crossovers, but um, that's sort of the other thing besides synthetic. So that would be a non-synthetic estrogen, but it's not bioidentical, bioidentical for a horse, um, but I'm not a vet, so uh, I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad you vet. brought that up. I think that so many patients are shocked when they hear that. Um, but I remember, you know, when I first learned that, I just thought, why, why would we be getting hormones from pregnant horse here? And it just sounded so disgusting to me. But, you know, that was the gold standard treatment for a long time before, you know, they were able to isolate, you know, est estradiol by itself. And, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's amazing to me that so many women were on that for so many years. Well, at the time, it was the best thing we had. Um, and so fortunately, science has, you know, marches on and we get better and better stuff. And now we have bioidentical hormones available. So why would you want to use this old stuff that was like, okay, when I got out of residency, it was like the best thing that was available, but it certainly isn't the best mm -hmm. thing that's available now. And yet, unfortunately, people get into this sort of rut and it's what they're used to. It's what they prescribe, even though better stuff has come along. A thousand percent. Right. I had somebody actually prescribe that to me after my in-person guy now retired and I had like a nurse practitioner and that's what I got. And I remember calling my mom and going like, didn't you take this? And didn't you end up also having like a lumpectomy afterward? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, oops. So it was just like, yeah, we're not, I'm not taking that. I think it's interesting though too, that um, like, do we know how come horses specifically, like as opposed to any other animals or something about horses and research that like that became a thing? I would assume it's the volume of urine you can get from horses and they're easy to, you know, they're easily domesticatable. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think they're as docile as we think, but I think they can be made that way. So that's, that's my guess. I mean, if you wanted to do it from, you know, uh, guinea pigs, you need a whole lot more guinea pigs to get the same volume of urine. So right? <laughs> my oh, guess my. is that's probably at least part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, let's see. Mel Melanie, it's just an exclusive live Q&A for you today. So <laughs> keep asking your questions. You have all of our attention. Um, if you have anything else on your mind. Um, to anyone else in the chat, in case you don't know, we just launched a new face cream, Estriol and Tretinoin face cream. And next month, we are going to have our um head of patient services who's also she's an rn is she registered nurse no she's a nurse practitioner nurse right? practitioner, practitioner. Yeah. Nurse practitioner who spent a, a, a big chunk of her career and as a dermatology nurse practitioner she's yeah, sure. yeah. joe is going to be here talking about that with all of us uh so if you have questions i mean if you have general questions we'll answer them now but if you have more specific questions come next month um, I got to tell you, uh, so my wife's been on tretinoin for a long time and my wife, you know, is, is beautiful already. Um, but she's, uh, Good answer. <laughs> she switched to the estriol tretinoin cream that we're making. Um, you know, she was one of the, the, uh, 
one of our guinea pigs. So we did test it on, on several of us and our wives. Um, and I can tell you, it's amazing. Like overnight, almost how it improved. I, I like, I'm not one of these guys that notices things like I'm your typical husband. Um, but it was like, wow, your skin looks great. It's like, it was, it was amazing to me, um, to my untrained That's eye. That's great. <laughs> so yeah, I, um, yeah, I was really impressed. The SRL really seems to help. Um, so even if you're already taking, using a tretinoin cream, uh, the addition of the SRL seems to really um, be a real benefit. Well, and the tretinoin's like a low enough amount that you're not getting like skin peeling because it, it can be pretty harsh depending on like the amount that's in whatever you're taking. So it's really a good combo because I use it too and I like it. Plus the quality of it, like it's like really like almost velvety then it comes out of the pump. Like it, it's a nice texture. I don't know why it's like that, but I like it. <laughs> we good. spent a long time getting it like that. That's why it's like that. So yeah, yeah it's really um, nice. But yeah, that's the nice thing because of the mixture, you can get away with less tretinoin, but still get a great effect. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have less of that irritation. Yeah. I'm also waiting to see our Facebook sync that we're supposed to have live on that platform did not sync today. So I'm trying to resync it mm -hmm. as we're talking to see, cause I was sort of like, where are other questions from Facebook? Well, <laughs> not here. So ta-da, um, yeah, just, really excited for um yeah for us to be able to see the stream but it says it's starting so i hope it is um i guess we'll see but in the meantime um i don't know anything else guys that is top of mind that you want to discuss this is where we get to play improv there we go <laughs> I feel like we should have some some Winona trivia or a uh, you know if if anybody cares I literally have packed fifty plus gift bags to ship to New York so I've been doing that all day ready for <laughs> ready for I, our events person you guys both know Mikey was like you should just put it in a suitcase and I was like just like you put it in a suitcase there won't be anything left for me to bring like I'm going to put it in a suitcase so too much to put in a in a bag that i'm checking um oh so, gotcha yeah we're shipping it i was like it's 50 gift bags like I, i'm not it's not that they're enormous it's just that they're 50. so yeah it's a lot <laughs> it's just like i'm not a light traveler even when it's a couple days i get made fun of a lot but that's just how it goes so. winona events come to one people in the chat if you've never been um where anybody who's uh listening watching uh tell us in the chat where you're from if you don't mind we'd love to know where you are tuning in from if you don't uh mind telling us so we know where to go for our uh next live event oh madison yay madison i have a ton of relatives in madison that's a great town oh san francisco hey san Very francisco cool. i you know what i'm hoping to do have somebody do a live meetup up there in Pleasanton area, maybe Oakland. Um, somebody's interested in doing a Winona meetup up there, hosting one. And I was like, great. Winona loves to travel. <laughs> Where can you send us? Like, we would love to, we'd love to come visit you. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. That's good. Um, I was just telling these two that we hosted a local meetup last night out in Westlake Village here in California, and there was a really fun group of women. So anybody here, if you're interested in doing a local meetup, like if you wanted to ever host one, um, it's something new that we're trying for people who are Winona patients that have a group of friends they want to get together. If you're interested, I'm going to put my email in the chat and you can let me know um, if it's something you'd be interested in doing. If you would like to try it out, I can give you the details. Yeah. I think fun. the important thing to talk about too, is that not only do we just have the platform that we prescribe through, but we're also building community. Like we like to have resources for women 
to be able to, to share, you know, information with each other, share experiences, but also like we're building a community for women to learn from each other as well. You know, we have the Winona Women's Facebook group. Um, we have the live meetups. Um, and I think now too, I mean, the other thing that we're doing that I think is, is new and exciting and different is that we're trying to do some corporate wellness. And, you know, we could talk about that too, like trying to bring more focus on women's health into the workplace so that employers are a little bit more cognizant of, of how to support their employees. Cause most women that are going through this at this time in their life are usually at the pinnacle of their career. You know, we've been working hard and then all of a sudden all these changes and all these symptoms start happening and it can really be disruptive, especially to a CEO of a company, you know, a, an entrepreneur, um, anything. So I think that, um, you know, it's important that we're, we're doing that too and putting some of our time and energy into trying to help women in those spaces so that it's, it's beyond just trying to help individual patients, but trying to make life as a whole better for women everywhere, you know, is our, our goal. That's amazing. Well, our Facebook says it's live, but, um, it's, it's not showing all of us. So I think we're having a kink today. Maybe today's not our day for, for the webinar. This may be the uh, shortest. Well, the, thank uh, goodness for webinar. Melanie coming out tonight and putting yeah, some really. questions in there. <laughs> right? I think this literally goes down in history as the shortest webinar in the history of, of, of Winona webinars, at least that I've been on. I don't know about yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's we usually okay. have more questions than we can answer and we're here all night which is fun um yeah thank you melanie for asking your questions and if you think of anything you know you know where to find us hopefully melanie are you a winona patient i assume you are it's just three weeks yeah oh yes okay good well yay who uh if either of these well it would probably be dr green right is dr green your physician what's that i was just asking her if if oh. you were her doctor, do you do Wisconsin? I do. Well, but, I do um, um, Michigan, no. but not Wisconsin. Hmm. But yeah, there's other doctors in Wisconsin as well. So, oh, we have a question. Uh, what are the reasons to stop HRT after you've been on it? Well, I mean, I think it's they're all you know individualized. I think that, that the reasons would be personal for you, um, if if you're experiencing side effects or problems with hrt you discuss that with your doctor and we can talk about the risks and benefits of continuing changing your dosage versus stopping if for any reason you get a significant medical problem um, just in the natural course of your life that somehow would make hrt no longer safe for you that would be a hard stop and that's something that you'd want to discuss with your doctor right away these would be if you got a new diagnosis of a cancer um, you know, that would be a really important thing to let us know because some cancers can be fed by hormones. And so once you have a personal history of cancer, uh, especially of, of the breast or of the, the female genital tract, then that would really be a reason for you to stop HRT. Another hard stop would be if you develop a blood clot. Um, and some of us may be genetically predisposed to those or might have other risk factors for that. But if you get what's called a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis or a PE, a pulmonary embolus, those are absolute hard stop that you need to stop HRT. So those are the main big ones. Um, but as far as if you're just feeling ready and you feel like you've been on it for a long time and you want to try to go off of it, you know, then that's something that that's a reason why some women decide, you know, they said, well, I think I'm over the hump of the worst part of it. I want to see how I do without the medication. Um, then we can try to stop the HRT and see how you feel. Um, but it's, it's really something that you have an ongoing conversation and, and in the medical community, we like to talk about shared decision-making, right? So, you know, a long, long ago, it was this very paternalistic way of like, the doctor tells you what to do and here's your order, you do it. Now we like to have conversations. We like to like lay out your buffet of options for you. And we like to talk about it and really come to a, a shared decision-making process with you about what might be best for you as a patient. It's, it's really a, a conversation and a dialogue that we like to have with you and, and come up with a plan because as a patient, you're much more likely to do well in your treatment, to be compliant with your treatment. If you were part of that decision-making process to decide on that particular treatment. So, you know, I think it's um, a way that medicine has evolved and healthcare has evolved for the positive compared to, you know, 20, 30 years ago. 
Plus, you know, you're the one living in your body. Um, and so mm -hmm. you've got to tell us how this is making you feel and what it's important to you. Um, because, you know, you're the one that's going to get the benefits. You're the ones that are taking the risk. Um, and so you're the one that ultimately has to decide. I mean, I, I always see myself really as an educator. My job <laughs> as a physician is to explain things in ways you can understand so that you can decide what's the right thing for you. Um, and I think that's the, the right way to do medicine. That's the approach we take it when on. That's why we do the Q and A's. That's why we have so much, so many resources educational resources uh, at Winona is an informed patient is a, is a, a better, happier patient because they're getting the treatment that's best going to be suited for them individually, rather than just a cookie cutter, like this is what you get. Right. Yeah. Well, friends, um, I wish I could get the live stream working on Facebook. We're also having an issue tonight with that. So I know we're connected to all of you through our platform but um yeah it seems as if you're just not having an easy time with facebook so unless uh anybody has any objections <laughs> we can call well, it. it looks like melanie had another set of questions that she oh, just put in so sorry melanie hi thank you uh do the symptoms ever go away in time and will sleep always be an issue well so the the question, I mean, the answer to that is that yes. So usually the worst symptoms of perimenopause and menopause are from the, the sudden hormone fluctuations that you're getting as your body is going through the decline of its own estrogen production from, from your ovaries as we age. So if you didn't take any medication, would those hot flashes and night sweats get better with time? Yes, they would. Um, so sleep is an often very, very common issue for a lot of patients, but Sleep is also one of those things that tends to be a continued issue as, as we age. We have these normal rhythms and circadian rhythms in our body. Um, and sometimes as we, as we age and our body ages and our brain ages, even with the hormone changes, you know, it's a constellation of different things that can happen, but it's not, it's not uncommon for, for women into their sixties and seventies, even after they're over the worst part of their menopause symptoms to continue having problems with sleep and insomnia staying asleep, getting quality sleep. Um, unfortunately, that's way too common. And I've heard it from, I don't know how many patients over the years, but also I've seen it in, in relatives as well, that sleep becomes this, uh, you know, this nebulous dream <laughs> that a lot of people, they can't achieve good sleep or can't stay asleep for long um, without some kind of help as, as we get older. And it's unfortunate because, you know, probably um probably one of the things that would be most restorative for many of us and we all function our best if we get good sleep you know so it's something that we have to work at well um you guys well you guys dr green you don't have this issue but cat do you have sleep issues related to perimenopause well i i did my my biggest issue i think that one of my sleep issues has been iatrogenic, meaning that it's been caused <laughs> by my profession. So as an OBGYN, um, you know, most of the time when we, we do call in the hospital, we're in the hospital for 24 hours. It's very disordered sleep. Um, babies like to come in the wee hours of the night. So I would say that for the, for the bulk of my career, I've had very dysfunctional sleep. And so as a result, I could sleep anywhere, anyhow. I've fallen asleep standing up when I was in the army, like, you know, in the back of a room. Um, I can fall asleep sitting up, but then in perimenopause and, and with the constellation of other symptoms, suddenly I was having a hard time getting quality sleep and staying asleep. That was my biggest issue. Even when I wasn't on my hospital calls, you know, I would have the opportunity to sleep for eight hours, but then I couldn't stay asleep. I'd get up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., throw the covers off. I'm hot night sweats, you know, and then all of a sudden, then you get cold and then you're putting the covers back on. Meanwhile, if you have a bed partner, they're going crazy because every time you're up going to the bathroom or throwing the covers off, like they don't understand what's happening. Um, or if you're like me, you secretly turn the thermostat down and then my husband's like freezing. <laughs> but yeah. You're like, I'm just going to adjust this. No one's paying attention. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Sleep, I think. Well, and then that's the other piece, I think, right? With when your sleep is disrupted, then it affects all the other things about your body's ability to, you know, keep weight off, the cortisol, all the things that sort of grow right. up back, right, as a result of not sleeping. And sleep just makes people function better in general, let alone, you know, all the other unfortunate parts of the body that it affects when you don't get enough. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah. What about you? Are you struggling with sleep too? A little bit. Um, I'm also like, everyone used to sort of joke that I had like narcolepsy. <laughs> I can fall asleep anywhere as well. Um, maybe not standing up, but definitely I, I don't usually have trouble falling asleep and it's not trouble falling asleep is trouble staying asleep. So I probably wake up like two or three times in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's cats though. Sometimes it's not perimenopause. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes it's cats. <laughs> There's a circus that happens at my house. So, um, you know, sometime between well, like- Cats are very nocturnal. They That's when they, they like have, to play uh, through the house. Yeah. Territory fights over your bed like ours do. Yeah, it's like WWF, like someone will get on the headboard yeah. and- you know, and like, don't fight on me. <laughs> everybody, or they're running across the bed, across you. So there's a lot of that happening. But um, yeah, I think just it's so frustrating because I don't take anything to sleep. Like I don't do any sleeping pills or anything like that. So um, yeah, if I wake up, I'm up. And you know, usually I don't know if you try to do the thing where you like hardly try to open your eyes so that you don't wake all the way up. Like. Ugh but you're you're awake right you're like i'm i'm up i'm kind of awake so yeah but usually it's 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 sort of a grab bag some nights it's really truly perimenopause and some nights it's animals but the combo either way oh. makes me really cranky and tired um <laughs> and we're, we're still if you forgot to order an espresso pod so um then it's a real problem because then there's not proper caffeine yeah it's a, it's my least favorite thing but um you know, I guess there are worse things in the hot flash stuff. I feel like, ugh, I don't know for me, it's, it comes and goes like most people, but I feel like there are some times where it's more present and I'm just like, Oh God, but the, the having like sweat, like a wet sweaty bed that you have to like either put, you want to put like a towel down or like <laughs> change your sheets. Cause it's like, or you mm-hmm. roll the other side of the bed because you now sweated your way through your just like oh gross. <laughs> so I when I moved back to Thanks Pennsylvania, for um, <laughs> <laughs> I I upgraded and treated myself to a very special bed, and I don't recommend it for everybody because it's expensive. But Tempur Pedic, I've always wanted one, and they make a version of their Tempur Pedic mattress that the very top layer is a cooling layer. Oh no. And way. I love it. It was like the best investment ever, especially with perimenopause. Like it it has made my sleep quality so much better because I don't have that problem of sweating in the sheets anymore. That's awesome. Because it, it like responds to your body temperature. And I don't really know the science behind what, what it does, but I just know that the top of my mattress, when I first get in the bed, it's actually cold and it's nice. Like I have to bundle up. (laughs) Oh yeah. Like cold, crisp sheets. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. See, I like when my dog and cat pre-warm on my side of the bed for me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Do they have, do they just pick your side, your pets? Oh, no. I mean, they're, no, they're equal all the, yeah. <laughs> I have one cat who like knows he'll go right to like my side with the pillow and he lays and waits there most nights. If he's not on the couch, he'll, he'll go wait for you. So... Yeah, then it is nice and toasty, which is yeah. cute. <laughs> but then sometimes he doesn't want to move. And I'm kind of like, I need to lay here. It's my spot. He doesn't move. So. Well, I'm bigger than them, so they move. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you want to get laid on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, animals. Gotta love them. Okay, I think we're down yeah. to the three of us and one person. So unless anyone else uh, listening would like to ask a question we're going to probably hop offline. Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> She's in it. Yes. Right. Melanie, <laughs> team Melanie. 
We love Yay, it. Melanie. Thanks for coming out tonight. Yep. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone have a great night. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next month. Okay, <laughs> bye. -bye. bye, -bye.